Hey Beaches, Tiger Big Hills, thank you so much for joining us online as we continue with our series, Lead Like Jesus. Can I encourage you to lean in and take out your notepad as we receive God's Word? We love it. When people gather together, there's faith. Guys, there's some life. There's some healing available. There's some goodness available and you're all invited. The reason why you're here this morning uh, isn't a coincidence. It may seem random to you. I want to say it's not random to the Lord. Like He knew that you were going to be here. He knew the word that's going to be prepared to share with you today. He knew the people that you were going to meet, best looking people on the planet. I'm just throwing it out there. He knew that you're going to be here. And so you've come to his house. So I want to encourage you to be expectant to hear his voice. Be expectant for him to stir something in your heart. Challenge your mind. Mobilize your hands and think, geez, God, what do you have for me today? This is, you know, the reason why you have today is because there's a new mercy on this moment. And he, he gave you this day for a purpose. He doesn't, he doesn't, in, in God's economy, He doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste life. He doesn't waste the day. He doesn't waste time. And the reason why you're here is because you've got a lot of purpose ahead of you. God wants to do something inside of you, not just your neighbor. You know, he's talk, you think He can talk to everyone else. No, no, no. God wants to talk to you this morning. And, and it's an absolute honor and privilege to be serving you God's Word today. Um, we've got a, a team of volunteers. They get you early, they stay late, and they're here to serve you, add value. So if you need anything, please just shout out to them, let them know, um, that, you know, if, how we can serve you best. And I'm so glad to, to be worshiping the Lord with you. I thought, I thought worship was amazing because it wasn't about us. That's why it's amazing. It's just I really felt like the Lord was blessed because of what we brought to Him today. Uh, it's not just good voices. It's not just a well-prepared team. It's just abandoned and surrendered hearts, just giving it over to the Lord, saying, Jesus, your will, not mine, will be done. We're in a series called Lead Like Jesus. Everyone say, Lead Like Jesus. If you've been with us for any period of time, you would have seen that we finished the series, Live Like Jesus. And we found out a couple of the tenets of faith and how Jesus lived. And now we're teaching about how Jesus led. And every single one of us, every single one of us have influence. Therefore, we have leadership. And our theme for the year is overflow. And so what we pray is that each teaching series that we do would help you overflow with hope, joy, and peace as you trust in the Lord. And we're praying the same for this series, that you would overflow with hope as we teach on how to lead like Jesus. And, and speaking of overflow, um, uh, yesterday we had, well, on Friday night, we had all the cousins there's a couple of cousins come sleep over at our house. It was crazy. It was anarchy. But you, I, I almost thought we were going to lose one of them like at one stage, but they came back to life afterwards. No, I'm joking. But I, I was going to lose my mind, if not my salvation. But I thank the Lord that my quiver is full at two. Thank you, Jesus. Those who have anyone got more than two kids, raise your hand. Well, we're going to pray. Come on, we're going to trust God. More than, more than three kids. I just want to know who I'm praying for. <laughs> more, more, three, more than four kids. Come on now. You got four or more. Four. More. Whoa, there we go. I see the hand at the back there. <laughs> well, we know who we're praying for. <laughs> Amen. If, you, if, you didn't have any, if your prayer list is short, we just added a whole bunch of extra people to your prayer list. Intercede for them. They need it. And so they all came to come sleep over. And then yesterday morning, we took the dogs to Dogland. I don't actually know what it's called, but I call it Dogland. And we took the dogs to Dogland, and we went around, and, and we had a, a great job. And I came back home, and one of the kids had washed their face but didn't turn off the tap. Oh, yeah. The plug was in the sink. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The house was underwater. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I came home with the dogs full of mud, the kids full of mud, and a house full of water. I'm thinking, good night. I'm just trying to do good by your God. You know, I'm just trying to serve these children. They're not grateful for it. I mean, I'm just saying, look what they're doing in my lovely home. It's under water over here. Baptize them Sunday. You know, I want to baptize people, not baptize my house. It was just crazy. I'm like, come on. I wasn't very spiritual in that moment. I was like, you're lucky you're someone else's child. But, but if you were my child, <laughs> have you all said, hey, you're lucky you belong to some, but if you would belong to me, I was oh, you know. but we clean up all the mess. We use every towel, every t-shirt, every mop of hair. <laughs> like we used every thing that could soak up anything. We soak it all up. But I was thinking about this this morning as I was praying for our church today. And it's just, it's quite interesting to me that a very small tap with not a lot of water coming out, consistently flowing, could make a big impact. I just wanted to encourage someone today that maybe you feel like you got some small prayers, but you pray them consistently. Maybe you feel like you got some small worship, but you worship consistently. Maybe you feel like coming to Sunday is just a small thing, but it's not. You come to Sunday consistently, come expectantly, consistently. And even out of a small tap, consistent flow makes a big impact. 
I just want to encourage somebody today. Maybe you're feeling discouraged and thinking, am I really making a difference? Am I really shifting something? Just keep on going. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't grow weary in doing good for at the right time you will reap a harvest. Keep chipping away at your marriage. Keep chipping away at the relate. Keep on praying. Keep on, because even out of a small tap, come on now, made a big difference. And I want to say, just keep on going. Some of you feeling like, oh, maybe I need to give up. I feel like this is the word for you. Don't give up. Keep on going. There's more ahead. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we love you and we give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. Thank you that you're speaking, that you're moving. We open up our hearts and our minds to you right now, Father, and we thank you that you love us so much. I can sense your presence this morning, that you're already working, you're already shifting, you're already encouraging, you're already building, you're already healing, you're already recalibrating. I feel like the vision's becoming clearer. I feel like the fire is burning brighter. I feel like we can trust you for more. In this atmosphere of faith, I pray that you would shift heavy things that we feel like we can't move on our own. No, it becomes very light when I hand it over to the King. We love you, Lord, and we receive your word by faith in Jesus' precious name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Lead like Jesus week two, people. You guys have made it, and uh, we're really excited to teach this word. Last week, we spoke about the heart of leadership, and we found out that the heart is so important because you can do nothing without the heart. And and so Proverbs 4 taught us from Proverbs chapter 4, I think it's verse 23 it is, and it says, above all else, guard your heart for Everything you do will flow from it. It says everything you do flows from the heart. Another version says it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. This is why in the movies, when they go out into war, they don't put on bulletproof grubs. Come on now. Like, make sure you've got your bulletproof grubs. Come on now because you don't want to lose a digit. No, no, no. What do they do? They put on a bulletproof vest because it covers your vital organs. It covers your heart, the things that matter the most. Some of us like live our lives covering our hands that matter the most. The car matters the most. Come on now. That's not your heart. And you sp- I just want you to get this picture. Your heart matters the most to the Lord. Don't spend time trying to protect things that aren't of great consequence. Get your priorities right. Guard your heart because everything else comes from the, the heart. And so we spoke about the heart of leadership. I believe your why needs to be strong. Your why determines your what. Uh, it determines your motivation. Why do you do what you do? Uh, many scholars teach us and, and, and students of leadership tell us that why is far better than what. That the why in your heart will determine how far you're willing to go with what's in your hands. So if someone asked you to, you know, if your boss asked you to, I don't know, uh, send out some invoices or, or, or uh, you know, take care of some clients. This is your portfolio and you do it, but then your boss is no longer around. And someone asks you, why are you taking care of those clients? Well, my boss asked me to do it. And if he's no longer around, then why do you need to do it? Because your why is very small. But if, if you've got a, a spirit of excellence, if you take pride in your work, if you believe that your work is a reflection of your worship to the king, then you don't take that why, you replace it with a better why. You say, no, 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 I do this unto God. I'm not doing it working for him. I'm working for him. Does that make sense? In the same way, you know, sometimes, you know, when we were quite a small church, people say, I, I want to join a small church. It's great. You know, being a small church is great. Okay, that's your why, you hear. What happens when the more people come? <laughs> it's just, your why now is a very brittle why. It's a very fragile why. The enemy can just undo your why. And if he undoes your why, he undoes your what. It's not great English, but it's good preaching. You with me this morning? I'm just speaking to somebody today. Can I get an Amen. Your why determines your what. So if you've got a big why, listen to me. You've got a deep conviction on why I do what I do. Why do you go to church? Because someone told me to go to church. Why do you do that? Because my pastor told me to. No, no, no. I do it because Jesus is real. The gospel becomes powerful when it becomes personal. And when it gets personal, it gets into your heart. And then it comes out your life. I want to encourage you to pursue your why in the Lord. Why do I do what I do? It's very important. If you've got a big why, you can sort out a chaotic what. Like, I don't know what my hands are doing right now, but if your life is in what I do and it's not, am I making sense this morning? It's, it's, it's very important. It's vital that we get the why right first, the heart of leadership before we talk about what leaders do. So the why is the root, the what is the fruit. That'll preach, that'll write down. That's pretty good. That's pretty good right there. So we're in week two right now, and we're going to be talking about the what. We've got the, I'm just trusting by faith you have the why. Amen. Just say amen. If you weren't here last week, catch it up online. Uh, but this week, we're talking about what leaders do. So we, talk, we spoke about the heart last week. This week, we're going to speak about the hands. Did you know that leadership sounds like, the word leadership sounds like a noun, but it's actually a verb? Not really in, in, in English, but actually leadership is actually a doing word. 
I know I'm not speaking great English today, but I hope I'm preaching really well. Like, I hope this is encouraging your heart today. I'm saying leadership is a doing word. You need to do something about it. A leader does something about the state of events. A leader does something. You can't say I'm a leader, but I don't do anything. There's lots of leaders that have positions and titles, but don't do anything. I would contend they're not leaders. Leaders actually do something. Leadership isn't a position on the org chart. Leadership is a disposition that I add value to others. I'm here to serve. Servant-hearted leadership is Christian leadership. Leaders do something about what they're facing, what the world is facing today. Leaders are agents of change. Christians are agents of change. Can I just say this? You stopped being a spectator the day you gave your heart to Jesus. I'm just, you forfeited your right just to watch humanity go to hell. You did. When you gave your heart to the Lord, you became an ambassador of an unshakable kingdom. And now we have a responsibility and a privilege to say the same God who changed me is the same God who can change you. We're not here to say, hey, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that. No, 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 no. We're just saying, follow the Lord, get close to the Lord. And when it's personal, it becomes powerful. He can change your life. You, became, you stopped being a spectator when you gave your heart to Jesus. You actually now are participants in taking forward the kingdom of God. There's an old story, I'm sure you know it, about the boy who walks down the beach and the millions of starfish. That were, have you read it before? Have you heard it before? And millions of starfish are all up on the beach and they, they just cover the whole beach. You can't even see the sand. And he's walking down the beach and he picks up one starfish and, and he throws it into the ocean. And then he walks and he picks up another starfish and he throws it into the ocean. And he keeps on doing this time and time and time and time again. Well, a gentleman sees him doing this and people being people decided to comment. Can I just get an amen? <laughs> comment on your life, comment on what you wear, come on what you do. It's always in the comment section without being online. There's comment culture. There's always, in the, there's always a comment section about your life. Come on now. Well, don't, don't pay attention to the comments. Only his Amen. So he's throwing these starfish, and this guy decides to talk to him and said, Listen here, boy, there are millions of starfish, buddy. Like, do you really think that throwing the starfish is going to make, you're never going to clear this beach. It's going to take an army to clear this beach. Are you even making a difference? To which the boy just quietly bent down, picked up the next starfish, and threw it back in. He just said, it didn't make a difference. I can't make a difference everywhere, but I can make a difference somewhere. It made a difference to that starfish. You, can't, you might be able to not do everything. You might not be able to do all, but you can be, you can be all in in what you do. And, and you might not be able to change the whole world, but you can change somebody's world. Somebody else can, be, can gain value from your life by just saying, I'll pay attention to the person that's in front of me right now. Listen to me. Memorizing people's names. Lock, come on now, now I'm seeing some people. Locking eyes with people and paying attention not to answer, but to listen. Just to hear. In your place of work. When you, with your colleagues, listening, it might have been ages since someone actually looked into their eyes and heard their heart, not just their words. What a powerful, profound impact you can make on one person's life if you just take the time to say, well, maybe I can't change the whole world, but I can add value to someone. Leadership is doing something with what you have in your hands. It starts with the why, then it goes to the what. Might not be able to change everybody's world, but we can change somebody's world. So let's take a look at the life of Jesus. What did Jesus actually do as he led? Well, Jesus did a lot of things. Jesus healed. Jesus multiplied the food. Amen. Jesus turned water into wine. It's funny that people, I'm just, I actually just said that so I wanted to see who's struggling now. No, I'm joking. Turn warning. He did many things. He paid attention to the crowds. He paid attention to the one. He paid attention to the rich. He paid attention to the poor. Jesus did many, 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 many things. But I will contend he did one thing, probably most consistently of all, what he did with his hands, actually, was build a community of faith together. From morning till night, till his very last dinner, the last thing he did was have fellowship with people that were close around him. With his whole life, he actually spent his time with his hands, modeling and building a community of faith that he could pass on the mission to to take forward the kingdom of God. So often, we as Christians, followers of Christ, treat a community of faith as a byproduct from my life. This is just a side order on my life. My life is a stake. The community of faith is a piece. Actually, Jesus, if you look at his life, he treated this community as stake and everything else as peace. He actually, he built this team, this wonderful team around him. He built this community of faith around, and they came and they built together, and they lived together, and they trusted together, and they extended God's kingdom together. Can I tell you that there's probably not a a very much more important prayer that you can pray 
then praying great people around you, and you be great for them as they build you. Does that make sense? He spent his life building people, building people around him. And we see this in the scriptures. But the myth is this. If, 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 if anyone could, could maybe lead by themselves, let's be honest. If anyone could do the job by themselves, it was Jesus. That's, but the myth, the myth is this. The myth is this. Individuals great, do great things. That's the myth. But we know that's not the truth. Have you ever, be, have you ever succumbed to this idiom, this phrase? Um, if you want something done right, do it yourself. That's not what Jesus did. He didn't do it all himself. In fact, in Christian leadership, the best thing you can do is empower someone else to take their next step in helping extend God's kingdom. Jesus modeled this. He, it was very, very important to him. It's very significant on how he built team. Michael Jordan said this. He said, individuals win games, but teams win championships. This is important because Christianity is a team sport. Christianity is a team sport. We're better together. When everyone brings something, no one lacks anything. That's not just a platitude on a wall. That is theology that we see in God's word. Jesus didn't do it by himself, although he probably could have. If there was anyone who could get the job done by himself, it would have been him. But he chose to build a team. He chose to build a family. He chose to build a community. And we need to do the same. I tell you what, when your marriage is on the rocks, who's around you makes a big difference. When your kids aren't doing well, who's around you makes a big difference. When you lose your job, who's around you makes a big difference. Can I get an amen? I promise you, surround yourself with people who speak life and not death, who will encourage you to run harder and towards the Father, not away from Him. Towards His strength and not towards your own strength. Towards His resource, not your own resource. That will probably be the difference. Make the difference whether you cross the line or not. It's not, it's show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Guys, it's very important you pray about this. Jesus did. Let me show you. It's in the Bible somewhere, so you need to take a look at it. It's in Matthew, it's in Luke rather, but it's in one of them. You can take a look from, and there we go. It's in Luke chapter 6, from verse 12 to 16. He said, it says, one day soon afterward, this was after he had healed uh, the man on the Sabbath. I can't believe that you would heal someone on the Sabbath, is what they said. Guys, come on. Anyway. Heal someone on your day off. Do something great for someone else on your day off. He says, one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. Nowhere else in all the Gospels is it referred to as Jesus praying all night long, except for here. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed for long, but he didn't pray the whole night. Here we see Jesus prayed all night long. In a moment, we'll discover what he's been praying about. But I want to say, we, we, I'll show you that he's been praying about the people he's going to surround himself with. Can I encourage you as a believer to pray about the people you surround yourself with? I'm, I want to talk to parents just for a moment. We know the four phases of leadership with parenting, hey? It's command, it's coach, it's counsel, and consultant. Command, coach, counsel, consultant for parents out there. Command, we're going to church. That's Amen. We're going to church. When they're younger, it's command. They grow a little bit older, it's coaching. Would you like to go early or won't be on time? Never late. Amen. <laughs> Come on now, that, that's coaching. Come on. Counsel is like, what's the wise thing to do? Because the decisions you make, make you. So you give, them, you give them some counsel. In light of your past experiences, your future hopes and dreams, your present circumstances, what's the wise thing to do now? They're getting a bit older now. Give them some counsel. Give them some wisdom. What do you choose to do? These, I've, I've, I've re- like, what do you want? What's the, what do you think is wise to do? Okay, put the ball in their court. You're giving them counsel. Consultant, you have my number. If you need something, give me a call. Come on, we're all praying for that day. <laughs> that's, that's consultant. Do you only find a consultant? If you, come on now. I've given you all the tools, you know what to do, but if you need some counsel, I'm here. At some stage as a parent, and this, we can't skip this, I've been told, it's coming. Not for my kids, but maybe for other. <laughs> it's been coming. That you lose influence with your kids in a period in their life where other people have louder voices than yours. I promise you, you want to curate who's around them, those voices around them, when they're going through that season of transition, where your voice isn't the loudest. And they're looking to other people for influence and speaking to their hearts. You want to make sure that you have prayed about who they surround themselves. Am I with you with me this morning? It's so important, guys, that it is spiritual, actually. What did Jesus do? His heart was serving Nisha. What did he actually do? He built a community of faith. And so we see that he spends the whole night praying. Nowhere else in all of Scripture does he spend the whole night praying. Let's see 
what he's praying about. Let's keep reading because the Bible keeps speaking. He says, at daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and then chose 12 of them to be apostles. He says, here are the names. Simon, who, named, who, who he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas. There were two Judases. You didn't know that? Maybe you didn't know. Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, and obviously Luke doesn't leave any details out. The one who betrayed Jesus. <laughs> Fuck for you. He doesn't leave any details out. And we see the people that Jesus chose. Let's take a look at their, their CVs. I don't see any sports stars. I don't see any kings. I don't see any governor officials. I just see, I just see normal people. If you had to choose a team of, of, of just absolute beasts, they would not be them. People who he's going to hand over the kingdom of God to spread throughout all of humanity for all generations till he returns again. He never chose the biggest and most awesome and the grandest. He just chose normal people like you and I. In Acts chapter 4, it tells us who he chose from verse 13. It says, and, and they were amazed. It says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures, they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. What made these ordinary men extraordinary is that they had spent time with the Lord. Isn't that just, I think that's liberating. You don't need to have this huge CV to be used greatly by God. You just need to spend time with Jesus. Who is he to you? Messiah, Lord, King, and from that place of revelation, God can use you to do great things even in one other person's life. I promise you, when you're talking to that person and their life changed forever, that it's almost uh, devaluing when you say, well, I never impacted thousands. I only impacted one. And then the one person sitting there, wow, and was I not? But every single person counts in the kingdom of God. Not a single one is overlooked. And if he left the 99 for the one, if you can impact one person's life for the glory of God and witness to them, just one, and show them who Jesus truly is, not the religious uh, 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 person on the, on the billboard or a statue. No, 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 no. The one who died to save them. You show them, walk out your faith, change their lives forever, change mine forever. So what did Jesus do after he chose the 12? I'm so glad you asked. Mark chapter 10 tells us what happens. It says, Mark chapter 10 from verse 1. It says, Jesus called these 12 disciples together and did what? He kept all the authority for himself. He made all the decisions. Everything came through him. He was the bottleneck. He was the chief. He's the, no, no, no. He gave them authority and to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. What did he do? He gave the authority to the team, to the family of faith. He's given authority to them. He's given authority to us. We extend God's kingdom because God gives us an authority. Guys, I promise you, it's nothing great about ourselves that we can do anything in and of ourselves. We'll learn from Paul in a moment's time, a scripture that he says, all my confidence comes from the Lord, although he had reason to boast. He's saying, no, 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 listen to me. The only good thing about me is God. <laughs> and so that's why I point to him. And so he gives all authority to his disciples now and saying, listen, yeah, I'm not going to be here for a long time. I'm giving you authority. Authority means the power to make decisions. Did you know you got the power to make decisions and your decisions can impact someone else's life? That's leadership. The heart of Christian leadership is servanthood. The hands of Christian leadership is actually helping other people be empowered to extend God's kingdom. Let me ask you this question. With the water and the wine, because I had to bring that back to those so many people who just respond with the water and the wine. Bring that back there. So just ministry. I just want you to have resonance, you know. And uh, with the water and wine miracle, the first miracle overcoming natural elements. Who did the pouring? It wasn't Jesus. He, he gave the instruction. He gave the authority. But the servants did the pouring. They got to witness the miracle. When there was only two fish and five loaves, who broke the bread? It said that Jesus broke the bread and then put it in the disciples' hands. So he broke the bread once. He gave thanks to the Lord. And then the miracle, the vast majority of the miracle took place in whose hands? The disciples' hands. It was in the pouring, in the breaking, in the trusting, in the praying, in the serving, in the giving, in the believing of the disciples that great miracles take place. He's given you authority for great miracles to take place. Isn't that awesome? Not because you're awesome, because he's awesome. And so this is why the Christian can step into 
chaos and the storm with great peace and joy. It's because we don't come in our own strength. We actually build faith because He's empowered us. to. Be. It doesn't make sense this morning, church. Jesus' heart is to serve, but His hands was to build a community of faith around Him so they can take this mission forward. Your view group's awesome, but your view group needs to multiply so more people can get saved and discipled. I'm just throwing it out there. Like we can be this holy huddle for years and years and years and years with no more space around the table. I don't believe that's God's plan for your life. I think we stay friends. I think it's awesome, but let's make some room for some more people. Our view groups are overflowing, so we need some more space. I'm just throwing it out there. If Jesus made more space, we can make more space to empower people to step up so that we can make sure that each person deserves. Don't you think that each person deserves to be discipled well? Like, but I can't disciple this whole room. We can't disciple 30, 40 people. That are, we can do a, if Jesus could only do 12, maybe we could do, I don't know, maybe I could do five. I don't know. But let's create some space. Let's do something. Leaders do something about the state of affairs. So Jesus models it, and then Jesus says, now you go and do it. The team can join me on stage. He says, you can go do it. I love it. Today's Baptism Sunday. Jackie spoke about it. When I got baptized, uh, Andre Kriop, he's preaching in a couple weeks, and I want to encourage you to get to church that week. You're going to be blessed. Um, Andre, uh, he baptized me at a summer camp in a place called Rocklands. Anyone ever been to Rocklands? Uh, it's awesome. Your youth camps there. It's just like crazy. Baboons, awesome. Lock windows. It's, anyway, we started acting like baboons. Yeah. You don't know about that. That's fine. Rock was awesome. He baptized me in the pool, and he prayed for me, put his arm around me, and the next thing that he said, he said, bro, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptize me, put his arm around me, and he says, now, nah, I want you to go do the same for someone else. I want you to go do the same for someone else. I had such a, an amazing moment with the Lord. And I'll never forget that. I'm just like thinking, geez, that was insane. I remember the mountains. I remember it was a beautiful day. Summer camp sunburn. It was great. The hair was just done. It was like beautiful. It's like all the way down. L'Oreal, because I'm worth it. I came out the water, guys. It was, like, I was, I was beautiful. Like, I had the heart. You know when your hair gets light from the sun? I don't remember what that like anymore, you know, but I had that little, you know, stereopy there, put a little lemon in the hair. It was like, a, uh, I got a, someone got a photo of the, the moment, I actually should have taken the photo of the photo. It's like, old, I'm old school, I still got old school photos. And I come out this moment, it's just so awesome, and God, I just feel the presence. Guys, I feel my heart is full. I feel like, I feel like God can accept me, and He's washed me clean. I feel so full. I can't believe someone would choose me to be on their team. All my rubbish. So full. Love Andre so much. I honor him. He baptizes me. I come up and he says, Now you go do the same for somebody else. You go take the time. You know, I spend more time with Andre in his car and watching rugby at his house than I ever did probably in a church service. But it made a big impact on my life. I was just one. But I'll never forget when I came up, Andre said, oh, you just go do something for somebody else. I think as Christians, we have the responsibility, we have the, we have the honor and responsibility to go do something for somebody else. To go invite them. Same God to change me, same God to change you. Baptize them. To walk with them. To be blessed. To bless them. This is the gospel. This is how we take ground for the kingdom of God. One by one by one by one. There are many people who come to our church every Sunday. That's awesome. And we, and we reach the lost at any cost and we go far and we spread wide. But it's one by one by one by one. I love what Jackie says. Jesus sees you personally today. He sees you personally. And he did that for me. I believe he wants to ask you to do the same thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says this, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, which is the law, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Do you know what he's talking about? He's saying that when you hold yourself up against the law, you think, I'll never make it. Then Jesus came to fulfill the law and he gave us his spirit 
And because He fulfilled the law and He lives in us, now we have life. It actually represented death because we could never make it. But because He fulfilled it, we have Him. We have life. We aren't competent in ourselves. The reason why I want to harbor on this point is because sometimes you disqualify yourself because you think you've got nothing to bring. I can't do anything because I've got nothing to bring. I want to say, that's okay. God says, I, little is much in the hands of God. He created the whole world from nothing. If you feel like you've got nothing, and maybe you don't feel like you've got, I don't know, well, put your hands in the life of God. Our competence always, has always, and always will come from Him. The heart of God is to serve others in leadership. The hands of God is to add value to other people. Can we stand to our feet as we pray this morning? I was so excited this week preparing for church. I always am. I don't know if you can tell. I'm always excited to come to God's house. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. I'm excited. I'm going to meet with my father. You guys rock up. That's great. But I'm saying, I'm going to my father's house. And I was just super excited this week. Monday, growth track was amazing. We had like 20 odd more people to step through growth track. And that's just awesome because people get to begin their journey in discovering their spiritual gifts. 80% of the body of Christ don't know why God has put them here. Am I a hand or a foot? So we do a little spiritual beginning of a spiritual gift assessment saying, what does God put inside of you? I think the best attitude to have when serving the Lord is not say I'm a hand or a foot, but I'll be a hand or a foot as long as I get to add value to the body. I think that's the best disposition to have. I'm not, I'm just here to add value. Growth track was awesome. Tuesday, all our leaders got together. Do you know that your leaders pray for you? How awesome is that? They pray for you. We contend for your family, for your children, for your business, for your finance, for your healing, for your blessing. We pray and we trust God. God, come through for them. As they, the prayer requests that we get, and we pray for every single, we trust God. And we anointed every leader with oil, representing the divine anointing of God, just how His Spirit does the work. It's not us, not by strength or by might. And we anointed each one. Wednesday. We had view group on Wednesday, and it was awesome to hear all the testimonies and see what God's doing in people's lives. It was just, a sm- we were around a- one table. We were, uh, you know, sharing a meal together and just sharing a bit of life together. It was so, so special. Youth started on Friday again. Yesterday, true ministry. You've ministered to so many children, so many families. It was just wonderful hearing the testimonies come in, people giving their hearts to the Lord. And today we're in God's house, and I just... My heart is just so full. Last night we met as a Zambia team, a team that's going to Zambia in June. And we prayed and we did a little bit of debrief and we ate a lot of food, which was great. Thank you, Jesus. I think food should always be involved. Say amen. It was just awesome. And we were praying for the Zambia trip that we're going on in a couple months and praying for the people that we will meet that we don't know, but God knows. And so He's sending us. He's speaking to us now because of who we're going to meet then. And so we just prayed all these things. And then we prayed for Sundays. Prayed this morning, interceded for you guys. I just... My heart is so full. I really believe God's encouraging you to take your next step, not because you feel like you can, but if you're willing, He makes you able. So I just want to pray for us this morning. So let's open up our hearts, close our eyes. Jesus, I just, I pray, I pray right now for every single person that you speak into them in a powerful way, that you would move, you would shift, you would do something great in their hearts, that they would take their next step with you. The heart of leadership is to serve others. The hands of leadership is to build others. I pray that we would see that we have influence, that you have placed us for a purpose. And Jesus, I pray that we would be bold and we would be aware and we would be sensitive to your spirit. When we go to work tomorrow, when we meet with our colleagues, when we're with our family today, we'd be sensitive. When we're in the shops, we'd be sensitive to that one, the one starfish, the one person that we can add value to, Lord, one by one by one by one. Maybe today, this is your day. This is your one day where It's not one day I will, today is day one that I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Maybe this is your day. I want to welcome you into the family, friend. And the way that we enter the kingdom is through the Son. It says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. That He doesn't make you better. The Bible says that He transforms you and makes you brand new. Transforms you from the kingdom of darkness, transfers you to the kingdom of light. And if that's you here this morning with every eye closed and head bowed, you're saying, Dino, that's me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I'm making a decision for myself. I'm giving my heart to the Lord. Then I want to pray with you today. We're all going to pray together. If that's you saying, Dino, today I'm making this decision for myself. I'm choosing Jesus because I believe He died for me and rose on my behalf. And because He rose, I will rise too. And so I'm choosing Him to be my Lord, Savior, and King. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now. That's awesome. 
Anyone else here this morning saying, I'm giving my heart to Jesus. Today is the day I decide. I'm making a decision to give my heart to Jesus. Someone's going to give you a small pamphlet. Anyone else this morning, don't leave this place without making this decision. Raise your hand. Say, that's me. I'm looking around. I see this hand over here. I just want to make sure that everyone gets the next step. I'm praying this prayer. Anyone else this morning, that's me. I'm making this decision to give my heart to the Lord. Today is the day. Then I want us as a family of faith, back to front, side to side, we're all going to pray together. This is your one day. The Lord receives your prayer personally as if it was just you and Him. So let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me, wash me clean, make me new. And by faith, I believe I'm a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And I promise to worship you all the days of my life. In Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. Can we celebrate with some people who gave their hearts to the Lord today? Well, church, we hope that message encourages you. We would love to see you in person at our services on a Sunday morning at 8.45, 10.15 or 5 p.m. If you'd like more information, please visit our website at tigerberghills.church.